No, they're little pigeons. Disgusting. The rats of the sky. The sleeves are gay. I can say that now because I've competed in sleeves. Oh, I thought you were going to say because you've uh, done gay for pay. Got to start a foot finder first. You do know a Splenda mommy. Uh, sugar mommies are hard to find, but Splenda mommies. Mm, Splenda, more, yeah. Maybe a monk fruit mommy. Stevia in the raw. Oh, man, definitely raw. If if we did a fuck, Mary kill with squat and bench, I'd try to get a threesome going with those two. And Fair my enough. deadlift is just a little cuck in the corner. The first day that I trained uh, for powerlifting that after that guy asked if I was a pussy and uh, I hit, I think it was a 315 bench for the first time. Um, I was doing bodybuilding splits at that time and I would usually go home and take a nap. But that day was different. I trained powerlifting. I went home and I was like, I'm not sleepy. I'm not deprived of all the energy and everything. So I, uh, I stayed awake and I went out with um, my family to get sandwiches and uh, we get a call from a paint estimate that our house is burning down and so like we go back and it was a like a five alarm just total the house is total just burnt all the way up and um so we got an apartment in a different town over actually the city we're living in now and um it was like it never felt like home so like that maslow's hierarchy of needs has never had like a, a home base like, I, I currently have a bed in my car because I'm not ever sure that I'm going to have somewhere to go home to. Um, but after it, 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 it's almost like that house fire. I hate using it as an excuse for anything because it's like I overcame that. I'm resilient and, and I don't want to be able to like point at us. I don't want to victimize myself with things. But like a lot of the mental health issues that I've had have kind of like popped up ever since after that. And like my first year of college, um, I would the first semester I was in um I was at Drexel University um in Philadelphia and I was like there's no windows here I am just depressed all the time so I transferred to the University of New Hampshire and like I was like I don't have any friends here I I I don't belong anywhere I don't have anywhere to be and I I got I started having suicidal ide, ide, ideation. idealization idea yeah ideation yeah ideations yeah and um at that time, I, I I went to my doctor and they they pres they uh, diagnosed me with major depression and they prescribed me, um, I think it was Prozac. And I was like, why doesn't my dick work anymore? But um, shuffle that around. And um, I was pretty good with the medication for a while. And then it was, I think it was, it was 2019. So that was 2015. Um, 2019, I, I just snapped because I had been bottling everything up and I ended up having to go into an intake hospital um, right after my doctor changed my prescription to Abilify because I was, uh, I couldn't even go outside. I was just so afraid of sounds and, and everything. And uh, the anxiety was just over the top and I couldn't do anything. And I actually hallucinated a whole cat, uh, an orange tabby cat named George. He had a whole spot in my heart and when i came off of the abilify i was like so where's george and my wife was like uh what i was like this whole cat where's where's yeah. george so like i had to overcome that and so i was in um inpatient like basically you think padded walls and everything it's not like that it's it's basically they stick you in rooms you're not allowed to have any sort of shoelaces because like i was having the the suicidal ideations again uh except with a different plan um, and, uh, it, it, that was probably one of the most terrifying experiences I had ever seen. Cause I was like, if I don't take care of myself, I'm going to look at, I'm going to basically fit more in here with every, like there was a, um, schizophrenic person who had been there for months. And it was like one of those, you should only be here for a week. There were people there. They were like, yeah, I've been here since January. And I'm like, it's June, it's July. Like what? So it's like, Things are just get, like, I was like, I need to do something to make sure that I'm doing better. And then 2020 hit and all of that went out the door. Oh my gosh. And um, uh, I went back to, I, I had stepped out of school for a bit because I was like spinning my wheels. I wasn't sure where I was going. And um, I was like, I'm, I'm going, if I don't go back to school, the, um, 
that January, then I was in, I was, I was basically done as a human, but I got back at UNH and, um, I only had two semesters left before I got my, um, math degree and 2020 happened. And right before the end of the first semester, and we all went locked in and I had just been evicted from my apartment in mass. And I was living in my brother's basement. And, um, so I had locked myself in a room and I was doing 26 hour days, making sure I at least had food. And, um, that put me back in the hospital again. And, uh, that was, I remember seeing the, uh, the Boston riots going on, on the TVs. And I was in an outpatient, um, uh, medical facility at that time where I, I at least wasn't locked in the building. I got to go home at the end of the day, but pretty, still pretty terrifying. And once there was a gym that was still open back when everything was locked down and I was like, can, can I, can I go train here? And they're like, yes, just no videos. Do not show anyone. Don't tell anyone. And, um, I started training there again. Um, and pretty much with that, all of my mental health and all my stress kind of like mellowed out and I was able to kind of recover from that. But, um, it's like, it's it, the past couple years, it's been really stressful because the, the job that I, I got at, after college, um, I, I just recently, um, separated from that job. I asked for a raise and they told me to look into food stamps. I was like, what? I wow. asked for a raise again. They were like, just live in your car. It's cheaper. And I was like, what? And then my last day, I was like, I'm either leaving here with a raise or without a job. And they were like, okay, mm -hmm. bye. I was like, whatever. I've been doing the, the work of um, someone two stages of, above me, and I'm not getting paid for it. And they just yeah. started having me train people. And they still text me. They're like, how do I do this? And I'm like, I don't work there. I read smut yeah. for a living. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it's... And that you have to do that. You have to yeah. make the uncomfortable decision because if you don't advocate for yourself, nothing will change. In yeah. 10 years from now, you're in an uncomfortable spot. Maybe after that, you know, you're regrouping right now, but you would just be stuck in this like place with no trajectory, right? Yeah. Where you're not being appreciated for your capabilities and what you're contributing. And yeah. so that's the, it's the hard thing to do. It's the brave thing to do. It's the right thing to do, you know? Yeah. And it was funny. I was, I was looking at my, I track my, um, my HRV heart rate and blood pressure and the day and week after of, after I left that job, all of those metrics got better. And I was like, okay, I don't feel guilty about this at all. It's way better for my health for me to not be there. But, um, so after I, uh, I lost, left that job the week of the ghost clash three. And I can't, um, I made a joke with Craig Foster. I was like, we're going to take over the stream after we're done deadlifting because we're in the, we're in the, um, pretty much the, the low dots portion of the meet where they just stick us in the front and we have the biggest numbers, but we're also the biggest, but they want to see the little, uh, victim weights put things up. Right. So, um, I just told the meet director's wife that we were taking over the stream. She was like, you would do that. And, uh, we actually were allowed to take over the, sh the, uh, the ghost clash stream. And we announced or commentated on the stream, for the women's um, uh, deadlifts, which um, just doing that, I was like, this is more fun than I expected it to be. And um, on the way to the uh, the uh, pro meet orgy uh, that everyone says. Happens, oh, good. Yeah, it was it was we just went to Dave and Buster's to watch WWE. Um, well, that's a good thing to watch while you're having an orgy. Yeah, you know, of course. In the background. Yeah. yeah. A public but, um, orgy. I was like. I always wanted to be a voice actor as a kid. Like I loved Scooby-Doo and like everyone wants to be Batman, but no one can actually be Batman. So you have to voice Batman. And I'm like, sure. what if, what if I do something that goes towards that work towards my childhood dream? Like I'm not spinning my wheels, being a government contractor, just sitting around for six hours a day with two hours of work. And, um, I was like, what if I like actually start pursuing my dreams? I was like, what's, what is a transitionary job that I can do that for that? And I, I looked it up and I was like, oh, there's a lot of um, uh, contracting in the world of audiobook narration. And like I have a crippling audiobook addiction. Travis Baldry is my Likewise. Con yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been listening to Blindsight and I was like, wow, this is actually really good. And I, I'm like halfway through it. And 
after they first went into the uh, the spaceship and they came back and they're like, what just happened? Like, fantastic. And I was like, I'm really glad you like it because it's yeah. not for everybody. You know, I ah. was teaching uh, lit uh, until recently. It's a, I kind of have a parallel <laughs> yeah. timeline to you, actually. But um, yeah, I would, you know, I give my students a lot of recommendations where I'm like this. I love this. And here's why I love it. But it's not for everybody. And blindside yeah. is definitely not for everybody. But you're yeah. a math major. So you're coming yeah. in with the right background. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're talking about Tauruses and they're talking about the. um um every every single picture of saturn has a um mathematical it starts with an r remon no not remon um remon some no my calc is way behind me yeah i left that in yeah. high school so I, we, we, yeah. we talked about it in my um nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory basically every single oh, of course yeah every single picture of saturn um uh -huh. they actually don't know how they can like put the rings together so they put a uh a uh, ring mathematical formula that has a bump at one side and they just put that behind the 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 Saturn and it's oh, like just a okay um I forgot what what it was called it starts with an R but um they're talking about that and and like they, they've got like all these Lorentz equations and, and stuff going on um uh FLTs and, and stuff they're talking about that and I'm like I know everything that's going on in this book and it's like actually accurate accurate yeah, he writes hard sci-fi. Yeah. I mean, Peter Watts is a he uh was like a marine biologist, you know. So he's coming in with a doctoral kind of yeah. background. Yeah. Yeah. And like hearing hearing the the uh game theory and the the Chinese room. The oh, Chinese room. The Chinese yes. room. Dude. I was yeah. like, I had never even considered that, but that's exactly what's going on with AI right now. They're just in a yes. Chinese room. Yeah. It's weird how a lot of great sci-fi is so accurately prescient, you know, about 20 years <laughs> yeah. before it's time. But I'm glad, you know, there are sort of loose sequels. He, he has a couple loose sequels to that um, that are worth checking out. You know, there's one called the, there's a series called the Rifters series. It's uh, kind of the same timeline. People are working down in Mariana's Trench and they have to be uh, they're transhuman. They're genetically modified to like, well, surgically modified i guess to uh withstand the incredible pressure down there it's very cool there's a lot yeah. to reach out and i mean the whole premise of uh bringing vampires back from extinction to uh conduct space travel that was what hooked me yeah. but and like yeah, like yeah. the the whole they can see things in multiple dimensions but when they see a cross they just freak out because there's too many vertices and i'm like yeah that makes sense that why does that make sense it makes sense but i don't like that it does yeah. Well, I love the rational explanation. You know, yeah. there's not not something kind of beyond our reach there. There is a he he, he entrenches the superstition with a quantifiable explanation, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad you love it. And I'm curious, I know you've talked about progression fantasy, but if you could put out like a top five of the of the things that have been most that have stuck with you the most, what might they be? Uh just just books, like books? or audiobooks. Yeah. Oh. Um, a five. That's okay, hard. let's. Okay, how about two? I should have texted you this before. I should have sent you this before <laughs> we sat down. I guess. Um. Ah. Uh, I guess one of the things that that kind of, I mean, it's not strictly from um progression fantasy, but um, stakes are important because, like, when they're stuck in a video game. Yeah, if they die and they come back, it's like, oh, I, why yeah. am I re reading this? Why am I listening to it? Like, um, uh, I was reading, uh, I don't remember the series, but I, I read two of the three books, and I'm like, eh. yeah. But like, if if you remember, if if you followed anime at all, like the when the first season of Sword Art Online came out, and it just blew everyone's mind. It was like they got rid of the 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 uh, log out button and if you die you die and then it was like such a good season and then every season after that they're like oh yeah you can die but it's like oh all the stakes are gone and that is yeah it's a it's a problem it's almost a trope in a lot of anime you know yeah. it's like i mean it's the dragon ball z problem where it's like super saiyan is the best there's no level higher than this and then every season they outdo themselves the villain's stronger they become stronger and you just you lose confidence in the rules of the world because the yeah. rules of the world keep changing right yeah like i haven't watched um dragon z to completion but i watched dragon ball super to completion because yeah, they started I, I finish every time i watch it 
Uh, the Frieza fight's hard to get through because it's it's, yeah. it's filler. Yeah, it's filler. But um, if in Super they kind of get away from everything's just stronger, and they they've got the Ultra Instinct and Ultra Ego routes. Mm -hmm. They're like, because before just Goku and Vegeta were the same character, basically, except Vegeta was cooler and Goku never yeah. kissed a girl. But um, Dragon Ball Super, it's like they're like, all right, Goku is the technical martial artist and Vegeta is like the power route to getting stronger. So it's like they're they're diverging in paths and it's getting more interesting and, and it pulled the readers back in. So it's 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 kind of it's kind of cool seeing. Like the the routes to uh, the peak of whatever is is important too. It's like not just the stakes of dying. It's also keeping people interested because if it's if you're just following the hero's journey over and over again, it gets really predictable. That's that's yeah. why a lot of people got into anime because Hollywood and and just regular TV right now is so predictable. And then George R. R. Martin came out with the the Game of Thrones, and they're like, oh, not everyone's safe. This is amazing. And then yeah. like. I hear there's two more se seasons coming out. Um, it just ended when Jon Snow died. Uh, <laughs> I really need to finish it. But um, like that that's why a lot of people got into anime because no one was safe. Like anyone could die. Uh -huh. And and that was, that was fantastic. And that, that, that's the, yeah. the whole stakes. Mm -hmm. So, um, but through progression fantasy and literature, it's the, the more that you can connect to the text, the better it feels, the better it is. Because like, um, I, I would I would listen to progression fantasy when I'm in the gym. I can't listen to music the whole time. I only listen to music when I'm doing squat, bench, or deadlift. When I'm doing yeah. accessories or warm ups or cardio or anything, I'm listening to audiobooks because I'm I'm just enjoying myself, enjoying it, and I don't need my heart rate to be that high. I'm just yeah. do, going through the motions and making sure that I'm feeling the burn, getting the stimulus, and I don't have to like brain mash into it. And yeah, like, you don't need to uh, to stay at the top end of the arousal curve yeah. you know, for 45 minutes. Right. I mean, yeah. that's going to take, you're not going to sleep that night if you do no. that. So I'm glad you say that because it validates my choice to put on audiobooks. you know, uh, afterwards. I, I mean, yeah. I remember where I was at the gym. I was traveling. I was visiting my girlfriend at the time. I remember where I was when I was at the part in blind sight where they talked about the Chinese room problem. And it was like, wow. this is so applicable. Uh, yeah. Yes. It's like standing next to this deadlift platform. I was still unloading the bar and I just stopped and sort of gaped into the distance for like five minutes. But yeah. I think I did the same thing. I was prepping a bagel and I was like, wait, I need to hear about these squiggles. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I guess the, the stakes, the, the different pathways, because it's almost like everyone, every single progression fantasy, yeah, they're progressing, but they're progressing differently. Like um, mm -hmm. the main character in the Cradle series, Lyndon, progresses differently than the main character in um, Primal Hunter. Um, was it? Uh, Is that Will White? Will White. The, the Will White. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Zogarth for the Primal Hunter. But it's like they both basically it's it's like they're going to be the god, basically. Of, yeah. of whatever world like I, I guess it'd be closer um the primal hunter and defiance of the fall it's like there there's a pinnacle they're going to be there it's just how do they get there but it's almost like the main character of primal hunter he's just there having fun whereas the main character of uh defiance of the fall is just trying not to die and is his luck is just comedically good and they make fun yeah. of the fact that there's Deus Ex Machina going on every single time. And the characters are like, just let me just strap a rocket to you and hop on for the ride. Yeah. But well, yes, you know, was... that's something that's so important is to uh I, I used to tell my students until I stopped having students recently and started working at Publix, but I used to tell them that like if there's something that the reader would be incredulous about, you have to have somebody in the story call it out, right? So having yeah. his incredible luck being acknowledged yeah. by the narrative, it makes it feel cohesive. So Because otherwise it pulls you out where you're like, I don't believe this. But if you could yeah. just have somebody in the story or even the narration say, I don't believe this, like then you're still in because it's like, okay, yeah. well, there's things that don't make sense in this world, right? Yeah. Um, and so I can believe that in this world, this is just a, a you know an act of coincidence or whatever. Yeah. They're like, why are you progressing so fast? I'm like, yeah, 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 story. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. It sounds like you probably have gamed or you do game. 
I used to game. I used to speed yeah. run uh, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle back when I was oh, in great. college and also yeah. Pokemon Yellow. Um, I'm really, oh, my God. I, I love watching speed runs. Like at my job, yeah. when I had nothing to do, like my first two hours of work, I would write, a, I would be writing for a book. Um, and then uh, I would do, I would knit uh, a couple squares because I'm trying to make a pixel art um, Mewtwo. There oh, that's amazing. I have I have fallen way behind on that. Like um Shane Haller asked to be my um handler for the American Pro 2. And I was like, Yes, of course. How can I repay you? And he was like, just knit me a beanie. And I'm like, I'm not gonna <laughs> just knit you a beanie. I'm gonna knit yeah. you the best beanie ever. So I met him, knit him a uh, magic carp hat. Um oh that's is, the perfect yeah. one for a hat. Yeah. And it's like the it's it i was surprised at how hard it was to assemble all the accessories on that oh. and i was like this looks so derpy so it's perfect it's a magic card but great. um like whenever i had downtime at work like i would have when i wasn't trying to like study like trying to figure out how sam sulik got his popular Incredible, i was like i don't understand yeah. why this guy is 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 so big and so popular like i would be watching like speed runs like I would be multitasking. I'd be testing equipment and stuff um, because I was a radio frequency engineer for a bit. And I would, okay. I would have um, like oscilloscopes and everything. But I'd have like a uh, the AGDQ summer um, summer games done quick on in the background. I'd be like, oh, OK, this, this is. And then I'd like half heartedly do my work because I needed one brain cell to do that. But I'd just like be zoned in the amount of times I've watched the Super Mario Sunshine different routes for the 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 speed run is absurd yeah. <laughs> and it's like um yeah. shane haller's actually a competitive pokemon player too so like i didn't know um, wow. he's he's like he's pretty much got the the pokemon ranking equivalent to like an 1800 total in powerlifting um <laughs> nice so he's in the massive ball rank and he's yeah. like uh when we first started our podcast together i was like oh let's just finish off with a pokemon battle and i was like i'm totally gonna win i'm gonna win i'm gonna beat him and this was before i knew he was a competitive pokemon player and like i think i knocked out one of his pokemon and he was like dude you literally came in with a party of all ev lucians like there was no way that was gonna work and i was like <laughs> I, know, I got the type spread yeah but um he'll he'll be talking about like different matchups and things and i'm like you know that you could have just bypassed the entire pokemon tower of um you could have just skipped Sylph Co and the master ball by using a polka doll at the uh, unidentifiable ghost pokemon at the top of pokemon power and just skipped about three hours really of yeah and, and at least <laughs> the original you just, it, well i, I like the Sylph Co. i like going up there because you get on the spinny like tiles yeah. and they just sort of spiral you you get the and lap gotta, too yes and that's the only time in the game you're gonna get that right yeah Maybe Safari Zone. I don't think it's in Safari Zone. But. Uh, that's where uh, Dratini is, is in the Safari Zone. Dratini, okay. But yeah, it's yeah. like, I get all these like really nuanced speed tech for like the most random Pokemon thing. Like yeah. um, he was talking about, uh, uh, was it uh, Scarlet and Violet, I think is the, the most recent one. I was like, oh, the, uh, the speed run just gets a Flamigo and gets all of the rare candies and they just blitz through it entirely. And they kind of just break it. And he was like, oh, well, that's Flamigo. That doesn't even use Flamigo's um, hidden ability. I'm like, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's it's a it's an it's acrobatics. No, uh, no item. Just overpowered because it's it's um, stab and it's flying. It's it's good. It's, it's, don't worry about it. Well, as a purist, and by I mean as a purist, someone who can never speedrun anything, speedrunning deprives you of sort of the soul of the game, you know? Yeah, the story. I like, yeah, I like to take a uh, Rattata and not evolve it. I hit, I press B and I give it all of my, uh, like the HMs and it gets so overpowered. And I like going into the final four or the elite four with my Rattata and just fuck as my starter, you know? And there's just something defiant about that. Yeah, I remember back in high school, I was really into emulators, and um, uh, the uh, the second generation of Pokemon was was my favorite at that time. Except for the the bit where you have to go and get the medicine for Ampharos, I was like, "This is yeah." I don't like to go up this tower twice. I don't like it. <laughs> um, but uh, I I started getting into challenges with that too, and there was the Shuckle challenge where you just go through the game of Shuckle, and the the first half of the game is super hard because Shuckle just uh. sucks. 
Yeah. And then the last half is just roll out everything. And it's like, yeah, you're never going to one hit KO anything because Shuckle's attack stat is just garbage, but mm. you'll get pretty far. And like, I went into uh, red with a level 100 Shuckle and I was like, I, I actually don't know if I'm going to beat this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like cool things like that you can do with when you're not doing things legally. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Well, I love that. I love the emulators too. It's very nostalgic. I remember, I also remember where I was the first time I beat silver because I got silver first on my Game Boy yeah. Advance before I got first gen because um, it was just what was out at that time in my life, yeah. you know? Um, and we were going to Salter Path Family Campground and it was like nine o'clock and my parents were like, are you excited for our summer camping trip? My dad's got like the fishing stuff. He's going to try to show me how to hook worms. And I just, I beat the Elite Four and I lost my mind. You know, I was crying. <laughs> I was weeping as we pulled into our campsite and I was like, dad, we can fish tomorrow. You know, I don't care about this canoe. Do you understand what I just did with my fur alligator? My level 100 fur alligator that I named strength, but I misspelled it because I was seven. And I'll never forget that. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the real moments, you know, it yeah. doesn't the platform getting under a thousand pounds, you know, uh, that's, that's just not as important as taking the shuckle through a red. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I'm glad that this has uh, progressed into the real topic beyond lifting. Um, yeah, you know, which is obviously Pokemon and uh, audiobooks. Yeah. But okay, this is my last question in this field. I've seen you watching One Piece at the end of your full day of eating with the pizza. <laughs> um, have you gone all the way through? This is my first time through. Okay, good. So Hopefully, I'm... your last. It's just a huge time suck. You know, it's, and it's it's just ongoing. It's over a thousand episodes, and I'm yeah. I'm on pretty much episode three hundred at this point. Yeah. What what show have you been three hundred episodes in? And I'm like, oh, I'm just thirty percent through. Yeah, I'm like, I I tried to watch it back in high school, and I I just could not for the life of me stand Usopp. And like every yeah. time I would get to Usopp, I'm like, eh, I don't like he's he's a cringe, pathological liar. And it's like. Once I got over that hump of of the the kitty pirates, it was like then it really got good. And like mm -hmm. I mean, it, it kind of makes fun of its own trope. Where like if you watch Fairy Tale or something like that, or like Dragon Ball Z, even where like someone gets defeated, they're not necessarily dead all the time, but they're like out of the battle entirely. But in One Piece, it's like, yeah, you got defeated, but the the battles are taking on so long that yeah, they can come back later. Like um. Like, uh, I'm in the Ennis lobby uh, section right now, and Sanji gets beat, like, absolutely destroyed by the soap girl. And the soap girl. Oh, that, that was oof. that Nami versus soap girl. Oh, peak television right there. <laughs> but he, like, comes back and he, he comes and he saves um, Zoro and Usopp um, from the uh, the wolf guy because he just took so long to actually get to that point and they just recovered and he's just making fun of the point that like in all these anime they just I'm defeated so I guess I'm out and like the uh the Skypea uh arc just took way too long and that was like that was the transitionary arc between um when four kids was producing it and the new producers so they were just trying to not make it so drastic but it just took too long but it's good it's good it's getting good I'm waiting for the, the world building part to come. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes I appreciate a story that lets its world building come in bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, I, I'm very off put by a book that begins as literally the author's notes to themselves for this is yeah. what this world is like. This is its whole history before we even know who it's about. Like, who is the person that's supposed to be important to us, that we're supposed to want to care what happens to them? And what are they supposed to do? I feel like you, the best writers and storytellers do that, like, in tandem, right? And you kind of get the world as you're moving through it. And then once you're interested and invested, then maybe there's a flashback or, like, a cut scene where we get the bigger picture, yeah. you know? That's, um, that's, that's basically how I see progression fantasy doing its world building. Yeah. Because it's like you got this new person. They're either new to the progression side or they're new to the world entirely because it's an easy time. Yeah. And then they could just progress through. And as they progress through the story, new elements of the world builds itself up like the um, uh, yeah. cradle series by Will White. He was in a town and it, they were the only people that existed. New people came in. He left. Oh my gosh, there's this big thing. Oh my gosh, we're in this big city. 
with the most powerful family. Actually, the powerful family is just one of 12 and it's like the emperor. And then it's actually, no, the emperor is only allowed to control it. And yeah. there's this whole continent and then it's the whole world and it becomes a whole universe. And it's like, Whoa, I, I didn't realize we we're going that far. I just wanted a guy to kick another guy's ass with no powers. Totally. And that, I mean, that's a good move for a series or even if it's a one off, like in the first act, like page 100, the character does what they originally set out to do. And then they realize it didn't solve the bigger problem. Right. Yeah. And they have to let they have to go into the it's like the, the problem is so much bigger than they thought it was. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, Vampire Hunter D does that really well, I think. Um, yeah, I've, I've yeah. been watching a lot of videos on on storytelling and how to create villains and and um. It's like Tarantino does that. It's like the main character. Oh my God. Yes. It's like main character does exactly what he wants. And then he's like, now what? Nothing changed. And then he has like, he just freaks out. And he's like, I don't know what to do with it. It didn't do anything. The problem's still there. I did. I, it doesn't work. How do I fix this? And then, and then it's uh, getting Grammys or Emmys. I mean, whatever he's getting. I think Grammys, right? Or Oscars. Oscars, yeah. Grammys are, yes. Grammys music, Emmys TV, maybe Oscars. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean I'm too poor. <laughs> right. Yeah. The I mean, most iconic villains, I think, in, in modern film. You yeah. know, uh and I mean they're well cast. Christopher yeah. Waits and Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Oh. I, the I when I was um I was writing a torture scene um in a book that I'm I'm writing for a fantasy. And like I kept going over that first scene over and over again because it's like between him and Homelander from the boys, it's like you want yeah you want everything to feel tense whenever the character's in there, but you don't want it to be like oh they're just gonna kill everyone. Uh, then there's it you don't have eh. it's like um uh they're falling into a problem with Star Wars that they just had Vader just kill someone every scene and it's like oh well, it's, oh well and yep. it's and then they were like let's actually take out some of him killing people to kind of build more tension like oh someone messed up they're not guaranteed to die but they're going to come back and, and and do it better and it's like yeah watching old movies reading old books like the tale of two cities sucked but it's so iconic it's just they didn't know what mental health was at that point and that guy just wanted to die totally yeah and it, yeah. it's it's like it, it was it was such cringe storytelling but it's so iconic and it's like you look at modern books and you're like whoa we've progressed from this being iconic to these being just average mm -hmm. and it's like this isn't even a new york times bestseller but also new york times bestsellers are kind of out of touch it's it's almost like how movies trying 100%. to win cinema, cinematic awards don't really yeah. touch with the audience anymore yeah yeah I've got my own beef with the New Yorker magazine and their fiction section, but yeah. that's a personal, very long story Yeah, of rejection, consistent rejection, my hopes being set too high. So you know how it is. Yeah. yeah. So can you tell us a little bit? I mean, I don't know if you're ready to kind of divulge this, but are you uh, what's going on with your fantasy novel? Do you have kind of like a, a brief summary you could give the audience? Because I'm really curious personally. It was funny. I, when I was with uh, Joe and Briani at their house, Bri I, I was doing a little bit of typing and I'm like, this chapter sucks. And Briani was like, what's it about? And I was like, I don't know. Oh, and that's the problem, right? <laughs> I'm like, I can't really summarize yeah. it in a in a single sentence. And I was, I'm 38 chapters in. And I'm like, I don't, I I'm like 70,000 words in. It could be a single book. I could just cut and go into something else. But I'm like, the plot and the characters aren't at the point where I'm able or comfortable with doing that. I don't know when to yeah. end the first book and, and serialize it. Um, but basically it's, it's like there's a city um, that's kind of sectioned off from everywhere. Basic progression, fantasy starter city. Um, the main character, I make fun of how, what was it? I saw a shit post once where it was, um, what if a anime person sees their child born in it? has fun funky colored hair and they just know that immediately they're gonna die because that's how every <laughs> anime protagonist i was like all yeah. right so we've got this red-haired girl and an all black haired her 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 dad sees that and he's like fuck this i'm killing myself and um so the, uh an outside force comes in they're like hey we need 10 sacrifices and the the protagonist is like you're crazy no 
And they're like, all right, bet. They come back the next day and they, they just slaughter everyone and they take as many prisoners, prisoners as possible. And they're like, all right, cool. We're doing death matches one-on-one -on -one, everyone fight. And it's like, there's, there's, um, the power scaling of, of like whether or not their magics or whatever their arts work is previously the, um, the city thought it was directly tied to familiar. So like if you, um, bond with a owl or something, you get like ocular arts and I love wind that arts. Stuff. Like if you bond with a, um, a, a dog or a canine, you get like beast powers where like you get strength and, 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 um, uh, um, greater athletic ability. Like foxes get like super sneaky, good at conversing kind of powers like that. Um, but in the big picture, big city, look at po politics going on in, in the big city that they're getting led to. It's like, that's not actually how it works. It's, it's how much you can conceptualize the type of magic. So, um, it, it's like two parallel storylines going on. You've got the, uh, a group of, of people who've been captured and they're just trying to like make it to the end. And then you've got this one guy who is like a prodigy. Um, and, uh, he gets his magic and, and everything taken away. They like carve into his bones, like runes that make him so that he can't practice the concepts that he'd been studying. And it's, it's like, he's been studying, um, like spatial magic and everything. And, um, uh, he gets tortured the, the entire time that, um, he's like getting ruined. He's getting tortured the entire time. Like the, uh, the, the viceroy of the city is like, you have to watch yourself. We're going to take your eyelids away. We're going to have a mirror. So you have to watch this. You cannot say anything. Jesus. We're drilling a hole through your tongue. We're putting a lock there and we have a healer here to reattach your tongue every time you bite it off and make sure that you don't die. So he, he gets basically, he can't do his magic anymore, but, and, and when he gets imprisoned, he's in this like super hot or super cold cell. And he's like, I'm, I'm trying to like develop kind of like a Joker kind of like he mentally breaks, but he breaks through with a new type of magic that I just don't mention ever. And he doesn't know that he has it because of a porn I once watched with a with a tranny fucking a chick. And she said, there's no difference between pain and pleasure. There's just sensation. So it's like he can. Well, you watched it more than once. Let's be honest. Yeah. Proxy page. Wonderful. Sure. <laughs> but um. Basically, he gets he learns the the intricacies of pain through his torture, and he's able to um, kind of feel these sensations and manipulate the sensations of other people. He feels the hot, the cold. It's just sensation to him, and he's able to ma manipulate his own sensations so he can either feel pain or not feel pain or make other people really feel pain. But there's also the um, the healer who just absolutely fucking hates the 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 separation of church and state or like the the combination of church and state. And um, she's got a protege. I'm eventually going to kill the protege off. She's going to be too late. And she accidentally becomes a necromancer because necromancers are just healers. that are a little too slow. Um, I'm like, <laughs> nice. And I'm like, that's so actually we, a great tagline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, so we've got these, these people coming and I'm like, they're, they're doing these death battles. And, and they're like, the point where I'm at right now is like, they're doing these death battles and it's getting kind of repetitive. It's like they um they're not they're they're basically like toddlers doing their their um arts in comparison to how the actual people actually do them. And I'm like, how do I make this more interesting? And I'm like, so we've got I've got a whole world to to build. I've got a whole world to work with. Why don't I have like an antagonistic force come in and kidnap one of them and make them like a pirate queen? I can have one of them seduce the emperor and become like a a puppet master and that rules the, the the empire from the shadows i've got i can have a league of assassins i can do anything i've got all these characters just popcorning around i'm like what do i do with them i say the entire time they're gonna they're, they're gonna go through these death matches to make sure that they're they're part of this whole tournament of of whatever and i'm like i don't want i want them to actually do that i want the reader to think they are but i want them to go off and do their own thing or like yeah we can be like the strongest people in the world are actually protecting the whole world from like a, a higher being like aliens or something. I don't know. Get some Steven Spielberg kind of thing going, just kill one of them. The aliens come, they get angry, whatever. Um, One of the, one of the other ideas that, that I have is like uh, 
almost like a um, uh, shadow organization of vampires um, who tricked everyone into thinking that they hate garlic, but they actually fucking love garlic. So when people lather themselves up with garlic, they're like, oh, yes, pre-seasoned. I love it. Okay, so, like, so all of those are really good, but I just got to joke. You got to do the vampires, man. Terry, oh, yeah. that's like so Terry Pratchett, very yeah. Discworld in a beautifully funny way. Yeah, yeah. that's that's amazing. So like right right now in the in the city city arc or like the city characters, which is the uh, the protege and the healer and the the healer's protege, um, and the uh, the viceroy of the city. Um, he just came into his office and there were three bodies hanging with their throat their th uh, throat slit, and he's like. Oh, and everyone's like, you didn't do that yourself. And he's like, no, go find who did it. And he, and they're like, OK, we're going to look at all the, the upper families. Someone's got a beef with him. They all have a beef with him. And I'm like, but who actually does it? And I'm like, what if it was none of them? And I'm like trying to figure out how to like have that branch off and into like there's the shadow organization, because I, I'm also trying to build the, the, the viceroy into this character that just never leaves. And you fucking love to hate him, kind of like Homelander. Like, um, there I have this whole scene where the protege, the uh, the the guy who got tortured and the the healing protege are just talking in a room, and like they're they're having this conversation. They're alone in the room, and and they know that they're alone in the room, and it like they they're having this like heart to heart conversation. And then it zooms out, and it turns out that the viceroy has been watching at them, and he's like, oh, I can't fucking come to this. <laughs> and he, like this like shadow organization is like yeah. yeah but you paid for your time like you you can leave you just still have to pay and he's like fuck this get out of here and he just leaves and i'm like okay so there's that and there's like the the whole idea that like um there's free healing for people under a certain age so all the criminal organizations send the young people in to do all like the knife fights the gun fights because they're going to get healed for free. But if someone makes it above that age threshold, then they become more important because they, they actually have to pay to get them them healed and stuff like that. So it's like this whole economy going on, this this like trying to to keep things weighed out. And it's like, I don't know where to like branch off where I right, here's a book where the next one starts. They're like, because it's there's so many storylines going on. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to like George R. R. Martin myself and be like, hey, I'm really good at this. Everyone likes it. It's it's yeah. it's just hard to find a point to like bounce off of and like not get boring, not st stuff like that. Because I got all these ideas. I just need to put them to paper. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that ending, finding the right ending is always the hardest part. You know, as someone who's written a lot of trilogies that never got anywhere and never got published. And now he's thinking about self-publishing. Um, yeah. It's all, you know, understanding how to divide uh, the bigger picture, right? And then understanding what feels like a complete story that still gestures towards the yeah. larger arc. I mean, that's that kind of, I think the trick is to bring some kind of conclusion to what the characters thought they needed to do, but then have the oh shit moment where it's like, there's actually something bigger going on. So, yeah. I mean, and I one thing that I've found in my own writing is like, writing a novel to me the most the thing that's made me better at doing it or less bad at least is like understanding how to organize my thoughts off yeah. the page like outside of the story here is my organized the way that i outline right and the way that i outline chapters and like from a macro perspective like what changes in this chapter that changes the direction of the story and if i can't yeah. tell myself that i seriously have to reconsider why i'm writing the chapter yeah you know like, like having that chapter it's yes. like, is it, is it a plot progression or is it a character progression? Is totally. Yeah. And character, I think, enables plot. You know, you yeah. have to believe someone might be. Well, ideally, what you want to have is you believe the character can make either decision and both of them have consequences. Right. Yeah. So like to create a character who you is the you can put the reader into their head. I mean, that's yeah. the magic trick always, I think. But yeah, we can't blaze by this without saying. I can't wait to read that, man. That is yeah. so cool. I mean, and I love the protege who gets the runes carved into his bones, which is very grim, dark, very Warhammer, which I'm Warhammer 40k nerd. And um, just the idea of taking an overpowered character and then crippling them to, yeah. sorry, that's not PC, but taking their power away, right? Yeah. And you have to reset. That's, it's such 
great story fodder. They have to learn yeah. how to do it from square one. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. And he breaks through with this like previously unknown kind of magic. Yeah. 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 And that's it's awesome. it's and, and like you want you want the character you, you almost want to build this world and just like crumple it up into a paper ball, set it on fire, and let the characters rediscover the the already built world when they've already had all this power and 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 everything along with the readers. Like he already had the the peak level. He, like I I've read a lot of like quantum physics books and and general relativity books. So I was I was like he's been studying this, and I basically put a Einstein study the Brownian motion. Um, basically, like if you if you track a singular molecule, it doesn't just fall down. It, it like hits and it zigzags around um, because there's different molecules bumping it and from other side. And you can't predict the uh, the motion of it. That's Brownian motion, and um. So like they're in like a flashback, like they're like, he wasn't that bad of a guy though. Like how could he commit treason and like get suffered like this? And and like, it's like, I remember this time he blew his eyebrows off. He was, he was trying to, he was supposed to be studying this thing about how things were like, just not like falling straight down. And like, if it's small enough, it zigzags around. And like, I heard a boom and he was like, I found it. And it's like, oh, and it's like, he found like the curvature of gravity and, and stuff. And like, he's got this peak level you just take it away and he's like i am i'm a blank shell of a person now i don't know what defines me anymore and it's like 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 what do you do with that and i'm like all right so i'm gonna take him i'm gonna break him mentally make him like a dog almost like um from game of thrones oh Ram yeah the uh yeah. ramsey's like the the gray joy guy yeah right? yeah Who Ramsey I'm like, takes yeah i'm like his name? i want Reach. i want the, i want the uh the viceroy to think that he's doing basically that uh -huh. But I want him to snap and just murder everyone or like, I, I don't know what I want to do with this character. I just yeah. know it's, it's almost like I've planted a seed and like, see how characters develop around the tree that's growing. And like, yeah, if you, that's so like, fruitful. Yeah. yeah. And I think sometimes it can be good to know it's going to go either way and then wait until you get to the scene to decide which ways it, way it goes. Yeah. You know, like there's an amount of outlining that's useful, but sometimes you have to know the moment where you just need to follow what's happening when you're writing yeah. it, you know. And yeah, trust like that. um when when the uh the the viceroy walks into his office and sees a bunch of people with their throat slit hanging above his desk, and he's just like, Oh, I'm like, I want I want this to be the introduction to all the upper houses. And then like that's as good. time goes on, as I'm driving, as I'm lifting and I'm thinking about it, I'm like here's an opportunity to introduce the underworld and connect it back to his, his lack of his, his, um, his inability to come while watching people be intimate with each other or like have heart to heart yeah. conversations and like kind of like connect that. Or it could be like, here's a new entity that's been here the whole time, but you can kind of see how it's like been a block in the, in the, in the children's play toy the entire time is like, Oh, so this is how it works. And it's like, I haven't even introduced the emperor yet. And I just want, it's like, I want every single person of power to be as um, stupid as possible, like as lazy, as oh. um, inept as possible, almost like not trying to be like, oh, well, everyone in a position of power is just stupid and, and, and inadequate and they don't actually look out for the people that they're looking for. I just don't like people in power. Sure. Yeah. It doesn't it's, have to be like allegorical. A, it could just be personal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's not yeah. a political statement. It's just like so many problems arise because people are in power because they don't actually know what they're doing and they, they've got good intentions. They're just do, going about it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, th that's something that annoys me when I hear people discuss like books and try to sound. Uh, like they have read books and they're like, oh, that's an important theme in this, you know? And it's like, no, that's your, what you're talking about when you say theme. That's just a real thing. That's what happens when you put real people together. That's just what yeah. people do, you know? And that's what, you know, great fiction captures. is like a universal truth in a specific way. And you offset yeah. it in this cool world with garlic, uh, loving vampires. Yeah. 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 Tips and tricks all over the place. Misdirections everywhere. It's like, um, I read On Writing by Stephen King. He was like, he was Great. scrubbing down girls' bathrooms working in his school. And he was like, do girls really make fun of each other because they're on their period or something? And that's how he wrote Carrie. He just asked that yeah. question. Crazy. And he's like, so boom. He was like, yeah. what theme is that? He just asked a question and he was like, he answered it himself. So it's like, it's yeah. 
have questions there and just write a book about it. Yeah. What kind of person would do this? Like some fucked up shit. Yeah. And then you try to make yourself feel empathy for them. And that just can be its own book, you know, like, yeah. right. Or it could be its own, your own character development, right. Of that yeah. character. Yeah. yeah. Man. How long have you been working on this project? Um, ah, uh, <laughs> the first Hard time. To say. Uh, yeah. It's like, I started, I started the, 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 the project the first time I went away to the mental hospital, it's like okay. when I came out of there, I started, I was like, I need to express my feelings some way and just journaling and that just feels gay. So I'm like, let me express my internal feelings a different way. Let's create some characters. And if I'm frustrated, let me just kill a couple off and I feel better about myself. Almost like a serial killer, except sure. with fictional yeah. characters and it's healthy and, and therapists probably think that it's uh, not concerning whatsoever. And um, Definitely. So it's like, you got to totally build the world. There. And, but yeah. um, I, uh, w while I was working um, at my last job, there was so much downtime. I was waiting for, uh, they didn't get, they didn't have an NDA for me. So I'm actually allowed to talk about it. Um, they just, the exit interview process, they just expedited it and didn't, I could get wow. them in a lot of trouble for stuff, but yeah. um, I was waiting for a security clearance and it was taking three years to come in. So they were like, just sit and wait until it comes in. And I was like, what do I do? And they're like, sit and wait. And I was like, okay, I'm writing a book. So I wrote my uh, powerlifting ebook and I was like, okay, uh, I guess I could work on this project that I started a while ago. And it's like, I was like, let's devote a certain amount of time. I have, I have a, um, a calendar, but instead of putting like schedules and stuff, I put goals I want to achieve and the amount of pages or the amount of words I've written um, on each day. And then like I calculate how much progress I've made every single um, a, like month at the end of the month. And, and it makes me feel good about myself um, because it's like a tangible amount of progress. Which yes. Is powerlifting and, and, and all that. Uh, it, everything comes back to this mindset of just constant progress. Yeah, um, I'm addicted to progression yeah. in that same way. And I think that's yeah. why I gravitate towards writing, you know, and yeah. I have to exert myself physically too. So everything I've done, it's like yeah. measurable progress yeah. physically. Yeah. yeah. I, I've always said my biggest fear in life is knowing that I've peaked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I haven't had enough. It, like it takes a lot of time to do, to write. Like I was setting yes. out two hours a day and like I was getting paid because I was salaried and it didn't really matter what I was doing. I just... They were like, we don't care what you do. Just don't cause any problems. And I would cause problems by fixing their problems. And they'd be like, that's been there for 20 years. And I'm like, now it actually works the way that you want yeah. it to. And they're like, we grandfathered in the broken thing. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. They're yeah. like, we went from having four different programs to track this one thing, one process. Now we have one. It's so confusing. And I'm like, go away. You should have retired 10 years ago. But, um, like I was writing two hours a day then going through my daily cycle. Like, um, I think I had a couple videos where I would, um, uh, I think it was like last winter where I was just every single day I would do, I would post what I was doing all day and it'd be like, I'd wake up, I'd, I'd go, I'd drive to work. I would read 50 pages. I would write for two hours. I would, uh, I would eat, I would do this, 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 and I'd, I'd finish my work day and then I'd go to the gym and I'd, I'd have my gym section. Um, and then I would go home and, and do that. Um, but with the, uh, audiobook narration, like I'm, I'm work, I'm technically working less hours. Um, but the days still don't feel like they're, they're long enough. Like it, I'm in the gym less, but it's, it's like the setup and actual follow through with everything is taking much longer. It's like, I might record for six hours, but it's taking 10 hours to actually work every single day. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, where do I fit in my my writing time? Where do I express my uh, imagination and get my frustrations out on these characters who some of them are so stupid, I want them to succeed. And some of them are so stupid, I want them to suffer, but also succeed because I want them to be able to suffer as long as possible. And um, it's and uh, the uh, so I, I, I did a uh, audiobook recording for a. Um, a poetry book called pulling no punches the something of resilient it, it is the most white knighted poetry i've ever heard I've ever read every I, I read each individual poem and afterwards yeah. i'll 
that yeah, sucked. That's like, funny. how many times that's can you hard. fit bureaucracy in a poem? Like, oh as my a, gosh, how many times? Well, are we talking people... a haiku? Guess I'll give you a straight answer. <laughs> uh, but it was yeah. it's, oh, and like, I'm I'm doing with with the uh these early uh, audiobook narration contracts. It's 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 really hard. The the um the competition for a lot of the jobs are, are really high. Um, yeah. so a lot of the good books, good contracts are getting taken up by the seasoned veterans or like sure. people who have more experience. So like, I was like, I'm going to take whatever I can get. So I, I did a couple, I, um, auditioned for a couple, um, poetry books. I had, I auditioned for a couple smut books. Um, I found that reading, uh, gay books is really easy because you only have to have one gender of voice and you don't have to do female voices if it's just two so guys fucking each other. Yeah. Have you ever read Chuck Tingle? No. Oh, I mean, it's it's satiric, but you got to you got to give Chuck Tingle a Google after this. Just the titles alone will. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I was it's and then it's like you have that you have to have that heart and heart with yourself. And you're like, oh, if you're actually um, confident in your sexuality, you have no problem reading gay novels. And there's that. But um, uh, the 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 books that I've read for that poetry book, which has sold zero units, and I'm absolutely not surprised whatsoever. Such it was the worst book I've ever read, and I'm yeah. I'm doing one right now, and it's it's like um it's all dialogue. It's it's written like a script where it's like character says this, character says this, so it, it never has said Dick or said Minnie, said yeah. Joanna, Vanessa. Yeah. Um, it's like enter scene, characters talking, scene characters yeah. talking um so it's like very heavy on the uh the accents and the individual voices but it's also royalty share so there's no guarantee that i'm getting any sort of pay from that and i'm just sitting here i'm like i've spent a hundred hours on this book and there's no guarantee i'm gonna get any pay from it and i'm like oh how do i split up my time with something there where there's guaranteed pay like yeah. uber eats driving with the 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 audiobook narration where there's no pay now, but once I get good, look at Travis Baldry. He's living up his life. He's li reading all the, he's. Yeah. It, and it like, I mean, that's, that's one in, is it a million? How many audiobook narrators are there? I, I, I mean, I look on audible and I definitely recognize some regular voices, you yeah. know, before I even look at the voice actors, but I think you're right in, in kind of taking the risk early because you're building like a portfolio, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you might just get one that hits. You know, yeah. you might get yeah. some. Like, yeah, when when uh Travis Baldry read for uh Will White his uh Cradle series, book one okay, and then like guaranteed a bunch of things. Like it was a twelve book series, and it's what was it like everything after the fourth book was a New York Times bestseller, and he basically became the voice and and soul of progression fantasy. Yeah. And now he's now he's booked out until like 2030. Like I was That's reading, um, uh, I read uh, Jake's Magical Market. It was okay. book one was read by Travis Baldry. And then book two, they had to switch audiobook narrators. And like the first like 20 minutes is the author being like, I, I wanted Travis Baldry as, as much as possible. He's booked out till 2030 or whatever. So we we had to go and change the uh, audiobook narrator. He's doing the best that he can. Travis has worked with us. This, that, this, and it's like Travis is is set for life, and he's just doing this for fun at this point. Like, but like to get like it's the dream, and like not everyone hits their dreams, but everyone can still work towards their dreams, and and you got to find a way to support yourself in those beginning parts where yes. the dream isn't there yet, like. Um, was the 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 go to story of uh, J.K. Rowling being homeless when the first Harry Potter came out, and now she's the richest yeah. person in England. It's like it doesn't happen to everyone, but you don't know until you play the lottery. But yes, it, it, and it's not really the lottery if you love what you're doing. Like exactly, yes, and it's like I mean I know that for myself, if there are things that if I hadn't tried them, I just would not rest easily. You know, yeah. I would rather have put everything into the into chasing this thing and know that I did all I could um before moving on. You yeah. Know? You never want to be like what if. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially not if you're reading a uh Rudyard Kipling poem. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was actually going to bring up Jim Dale uh, as, as uh, another example of someone whose voice became so iconic um, yeah. because he narrated those. Well, he was one of the narrators for uh, the Harry Potter books. And yeah. that was one of the first. Well, actually, I was very fortunate in that I grew up from the time that I could talk probably before that being read to every night um, by my parents, yeah. like until I was 12. And that was like the best part of my day. We had the great illustrated classics. They were like abridged, you know, versions of like, uh, you know, Ivanhoe and all this kind of thing. Yeah. And I would just get read to and I would like be sort of drifting off. So I would kind of be drop myself into the story in like a half dream. And it's so cool to be immersed in that way in a story, yeah. you know. And so I had a similar thing with Jim Dale. And it's like to me, because that was my favorite Harry Potter narrator, it just sounds wrong if I listen to it and it's not Jim Dale. Yeah. You know, it's like um recently. I think it was like the 20th anniversary of the uh, um, Lord of the Rings coming out. Andy Serkis uh -huh. narrated all the Lord of the Rings books. And I'm like, wow, done. No more needed. No yeah. one's going to do Gollum better than Andy Serkis. Of the course. Yeah. And like he his his career's really popped off ever since. Uh, not it's like he, he his career didn't exist for like 10 years after the the lord of the rings because he was no one knew he was Gollum, but as cgi yeah. and everything came up he was now he's in everything he was in um batman he was in i think he was in oh, dune wow. recently he oh played, my god we got to talk about dune in a second <laughs> i haven't seen dune but i read dune uh, yes yeah i'm glad yeah um i taught dune last spring and it was such a fun class man i love that first one in the series I, I don't know how you feel, but it really falls off after that. That's an example of, I think that book is well ended to set up a series, you know, because yeah. it's like, oh, we're just scaling up because now you've incited Imperial War. You've won Arrakis, but now the universe is basically, you know, going to come for you. Right. Yeah. Um, but but with the Tleilaxu in the second book and it's like, God damn it, Duncan Idaho's back just being a lech like he's been cloned. I, I, you know, I never actually finished the entire six book series. Um, yeah. And then his son turns into like a worm hybrid anamorph guy. And it's like the first one to me, the first one's too pristine for me to let the other ones sort of water it down. But. Yeah. I, I, my old boss and I used to talk about it and it was like, after the first one, they were just looking for money because it was so successful. Yeah. That's probably very true. And especially when um it wasn't Frank Herbert reading or writing them anymore. Oh, but, right. Cause yeah. It was, it, yeah. I think it was his son took yes. off and it was just just riding the wave of his dad's writing and it was like oh but yeah i i was a little disappointed with the book dune it's like yeah. they put he put more emphasis on a battle between a it was like a noble and a gladiator that was a fixed fight than the entire war with the emperor that's a great point there. They do spend way too much time over the, Oh, and you, but don't actually drug him. You know, this is yeah. my gift to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, the, and the, the Baron. Oh yeah. Go ahead. The, the, the first half, it was like setting up. So it like never felt really concretely put together. And then when the whole, um, uh, the uh, backstabbing and everything happened, it was mm -hmm. like, it was so fast. And then suddenly Paul was in the middle of everything. And then suddenly, he and his mom was, were in the the uh, the dunes, and every single thing Paul did, his mom was like, "Oh, such a good boy, such a good boy. He's training, is paying off dividends. He is such a good boy. I'm so glad that Paul is doing this." And I was like, "Okay, yeah. we get it. You guys aren't dying because of him. Cool." And then it was like time skip. By the way, uh, this also happened, uh, and also Paul is now riding worms. And congratulations, the emperor has been defeated. Yeah, and I think that's that's uh, that's a great critique. And it, it, there is the problem of Paul just being uh, sort of prepared to succeed at everything. Yeah, you know, and you get to the point in the book where you're not worried about him anymore, and that's a yeah. huge problem, you know, in your investment. But I think the first hundred pages, because I actually really like when the shit goes down, and yeah. like oh, yeah, the Sardaukar show up, and I mean, yeah. remember the tooth, you know, for yeah. Toledo, that was so great with uh, Doctor Yui. Like, remember oh. the tooth. I'll never fucking forget the tooth because he keeps saying that. But yeah, I'm, it's it's almost like the character of Severus Snape was just Doctor Yui, but magic. 
Yes, that's a that's a fantastic comparison. <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, he didn't get played portrayed by Laurence Olivier in the film adaptation, which is really uh, unfortunate. Yeah, I didn't um, get a chance for the Dune buckets either. Oh man, yeah. If he'd just been a little earlier to this, <laughs> um, you know the. I think the other thing that annoys me is Baron Harkonnen is like so classically bad. Like, oh yeah, he also is like. Uh, a pedophile probably you yeah. know and uh yes and he's like this sort of very on the nose portrait of excess and like political you know debauchery so that's annoying because you want your bad guy to be a little bit more nuanced than that you know yeah. i think but yeah also that critique is is that because he was the original or mm. because we've we're reading at a, or the progression of the genre to the point where yeah it was it was like life changing and everything in when it came out like the first yeah. star wars but you look at the one okay we just ignore the last three that came out but like yeah. all the series Please. that came out and it's it's like the the storytelling and and the the whole world it just feels way different everything feels way like yeah. uh revenge of the sith probably the best of the first six mm -hmm. But the most impactful was the the original A New Hope, and it's yeah. like did was it didn't really age well, but it's still good. But it's prolific. I don't know if the uh, the the Harkonnen or the the Baron was he just, set the precedent. Yeah, right? he set the it's, precedent. Yeah. and then everyone was like, "He's good, yes, but we can do it better." Yeah, and then they like built off of it, and you've got all these different like versions of him coming out. You've got Mr. Snake Man, who's the epitome of evil in Lord Voldemort, or mm -hmm. like um, Lex Luthor coming out, where he's the 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 epitome of entitled rich boy, super evil villain who always finds a way to beat Superman because Superman's actually a cuck, and like stuff like that. Yeah. Well, Superman, it's interesting. Oh, sorry. What is Superman, Superman? Should never lose anything ever. He just everyone right. happens to have kryptonite on them. Yeah, it's just so calm. It's such a common element, apparently, yeah. in the in that universe. It's frustrating. But it's, a you know, that kind of makes harkens back to the idea of like, I think Shakespeare was the first person who really wrote like realistic uh, fiction in the sense that like his villains were complex characters like Richard yeah. III. That's a complex fucking character. That open and monologue it just rips, you know, and I think prior to that, he, things were such in the mode of like epics and myth and it's like here is a heroic force and here is like a godly adversary and these are forces of nature they're not people right yeah. if that makes sense and it's like ideally you want to have a force of nature that's also a person or a person that becomes a force of nature but like i think that there was a pivot where shakespeare started writing people who were had complex motivations right yeah. um and so i think that speaks also to there's something fundamental about the hero's journey being imprinted on dune that honestly star wars ripped from dune i mean yeah. that's my opinion but i mean there's um, a reason they can't get away from tatooine and and any what, <laughs> jakarta the desert right. planet yeah there's other temperates just choose one <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah that lore goes so deep i love watching like youtube lore compilations of star wars stuff oh it's wonderful it's yeah. like the, the first three developed the the concept and then the um the prequels developed the world it's like people individual the prequels weren't that good like mm -hmm. the uh the clone wars absolutely trash but if yeah. you look at everything that's come from the clone wars like the entire like the clone wars themselves all the stories that came from the Clone Wars, everything that branches off of it, it might be the most impactful of of the entire tr the uh, the entire yeah. tr not trilogy sex whatever it is ology. Se I'll let you <laughs> try with that because I don't know hexology hexology Maybe. sure yeah You're getting some um, Latin in there <laughs> yeah. have to have to get the Latin in there. Um, Darth Sidious is like weirdly a really tragic figure and empathetic and like based on his backstory. Um, I mean, he doesn't appear that way in the films, yeah. you know, but yeah, there's so much more we could go on. Uh, Bulk Boys has become Book Boys at this point. Um, but I do have a hard out. Um, and the hard out is that Willow has promised me that we're going to play Fallout 4 at 530. Um, and I need to hold that uh, late date with her. Um, but thank you so much for coming on, man. Yeah, um, I, uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. And I would I would love to have you back um, when you have the availability, because there's so much more to touch on. I mean, we probably did 35 percent lifting stuff and 65 percent <laughs> books, which I'm fine with. Um, thanks for coming on.
Yeah. And it was not. nice to find to meet you in person because yeah. I have this parasocial relationship where I watch your videos and I you're so funny, you know, and your channel needs to be bigger than it is. But like, it's nice to actually converse with you. Yeah. It's hard to grow. That's I don't know why some videos take off. Some don't. I'm like, I don't know. It's yeah. it's hard. I don't know what, what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. But I think stick with it. Something's going to yeah. click. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right. You have a good one. You too. May the force be with right. you.